this countdown, we have a Zorse. Now, this is a mix between a zebra and a horse, which just why? Scientists are out here just breeding animals that kind of have similar features just to see what will happen and what their offspring will look like. Which a lot of people fear, because what if we cross the wrong thing and then create a dominant invasive species? Anyways, these animals were created after crossbreeding a male zebra with a female horse. The offspring look more like a horse than the zebra, but they still have their key identifying stripes. The first Zorse was created during the 19th century by Charles Darwin. They are still around to this day, but are extremely rare. This is because Zorses are infertile. They can't reproduce on their own. So the only way we can create these animals is if scientists force breed them. Number nine, mules and hennies. So right off the bat here, a mule is already a hybrid. It's the offspring of a male donkey and a female horse. And a henny is the offspring of a male horse and a female donkey. Get it? Got it? Mules have been a pretty common asset since George Washington days, fun fact. But it wasn't until 2003 until the University of Idaho cloned one. Yeah, we cloned a hybrid animal. I feel like we're flying too close to the sun here, honestly. The mule's name, well, the clone rather, was Idaho Jem. That's a fair name. He's he's pretty well Jem, yeah. Number eight, sheep goats. I love these ones. I'm not gonna lie, they're they're odd, but they're very cute, undeniably cute. These little miracles. It was really this one goat in northern Germany who did this one. He saw this sheep on the other side of a fence and thought, you know what? Forget the last million years of evolution. I'm gonna try something. I'm gonna go talk to her. Let's see what happens. She goes to another school. Let's see what's up. I'm gonna be brave. He hopped the fence, went over, got some phone numbers, had some dates, did some dirties. The odd time this does happen, usually nothing happens long term. But when farmer Claus Ekstrenbrink saw this fling, he couldn't believe his eyes later. A sheep goat, or a geep, was born in front of his eyes. Yeah, and they named it Lisa. What a lovely name. How sweet is that? Also, this list starts a little tame, and then they get into some, you know, pig human stuff. So if you're saying, aww, right now, no, buckle up, it gets much worse. Starting with number seven, beefalo. Yeah, not necessarily the government, but back in the mid 1700s, thousands of ranchers, I'm talking like 6,000 ranchers, all agreed to raise hybrid beefalo. Yeah, that was the thing they were gonna change in history at that point. They're like, let's do it, and they went with beefalo. Well, they didn't really have a choice. The beefalo is a result of American bison meeting cattle. These accidental hybrids are normal. They're expected in some way, shape, or form, but cut to the late 1800s, cattle and bison were intentionally created. Yeah, Colonel Samuel Benson, guy was warden of Stony Mountain Penitentiary. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna crossbreed some animals. Yeah, take my thousands of keys. Thank you. I'm gonna go a animal life it is for me now, I guess. Guy buys eight bisons and then breeds them with Durham cattle. Yeah, what do you do on your weekends when you retire, I guess. The beefalo is a great improvement. Apparently it's a great milker. I, I don't know much about milking beefaloes or buffaloes, but Warren Samuel Benson, he was your guy in the late 1800s. He would have chatted your ear off about milk and beefalo. Number six, lions. Back in the 1980s, the Chat Bar Zoo in India started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller and has less of a shaggy mane, with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. On paper, this sounds like a good idea, a step forward rather, dare I say. The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. Yeah, it's like, hey, we saved ya. Just kidding, you're going to a much worse place. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was a mistake. Things weren't going well at all. His back legs were quite weak. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, obviously this got worse. Their immune systems started to fail more and more. In come 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. They finally decided to stop the program and then all these males were given vasectomies in order to you know, prevent any reproduction down the line. But there were laws that prohibited them from killing these animals. So they were actually just waiting for them to die naturally, which is, Sad. You're like, hey, great law, but yeah, today, come on. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's you know, it's wild that they wasted 20 years trying to do this when you know they could have simply just bred lions that they had and then focused all their energy on that instead of creating a alien lion. But who am I? I'm just a YouTube host. It's probably harder than it sounds, but man, this stuff is uh, it's pretty rough. Number five, Walfin. Well, there's a word I have never said before in my entire life. These guys were created when a female common bottlenose dolphin was bred with a male killer whale. Yeah, what a riot, what a pair, what a duo. These are extremely rare and they've been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity. 
Yeah, because humans suck. The first recorded Walfin was born at the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, but he sadly died not even a year after his birth. Just two days in and it was done. Obviously, this is not working out, but the first born Walfin in the United States that miraculously somehow survived was at Sea Life Park in Hawaii, and that was in 1985. And her name was Kekamalu. She ended up having three babies. She did survive. Now, the first baby passed away after a few days, and the second passed away at the age of nine, but nine years old. This is already a massive improvement from what we've seen earlier, and thankfully the third one is still living to this day. Yeah, both Kekamalu and her daughter are still alive, but they still remain in captivity. Number four, farm cattle. In the 1990s, farmers in India figured that if they were to crossbreed their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which would of course mean more money, which is better for everyone and their families. Now this was an ideal step, right? What could possibly go wrong? A lot of things could go wrong here. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting milky results, you know, good results. And they ended up with cattle that did produce more milk, but at the same time, these guys needed way more food or else they'd stop producing said great amounts of milk. They wouldn't get milky results after that point. Plus they were less resistant to local diseases, so they required way more uh, vet visits. So yeah, they're producing more milk, which will get us more money, but they also cost us more money long-term. So AKA, not a solution. Number three, dog mixing. Oh, this one's sad too. No more fun and games, no more milk and jokes. This one's wild. But this one is also a reminder that you can't just put any type of dog together and then just see what happens. Yeah, that's, that's not gonna fly, my friends. That's not how, DNA works. I got the D, didn't know how to do the N or the A, really. Back in 2010, a woman named Julie Leroy was working as an animal control officer when an owner of a pit bull puppy came in and said she just didn't want the dog anymore, wasn't feeling comfortable owning this specific dog. In fact, it didn't look like any dog she had seen in the past, which was odd considering her occupation. The dog had a shorter body, it was like stuffy almost, and its jaw was larger, and it had a massive underbite. It didn't look easy to navigate at all, this poor thing. Well, it turns out the dog suffered from short spine syndrome. This is the result of backyard breeding, just, you know, improvising on your own. Don't do that. Yeah, leave it to the people who know what they're doing, please, for the love of God. Julie ended up taking care of this dog, because she had to, because this person's like, eh, bye, and they had a great relationship, but this is not ideal. Don't do this. Number two, human pig. Yeah, of course we had to save this one for the last two. This is wild. This is some next level stuff. This is a Marvel film? Human pig? What are we doing? Scientists in California back in 2017 were up to some pretty remarkable stuff. An embryo was placed in an adult pig for around four weeks, then once scientists analyzed said embryo afterwards, they learned that the embryos not only, one, survived the process, which is a miracle in itself, but two, the human cells also remained. Uh, okay, now what? This is next level crossbreeding right here. The goal here, scientifically, was to grow human organs inside the pigs. And Juan Carlos Esbezua Belmonte successfully created pig-human hybrids at the Salk Institute lab. Yeah, can't wait till we have a pig superhero now, or pig uh, villain. Those exist too. Number one, Pizzly Bear. Yeah, we gotta finish this list off on an educational note. We always gotta remind the world that the ice everywhere is melting all the time. Yep, we're slowly melting, folks. Better believe it. And Pizzly Bears are here to warn us. Back in 2006, a Canadian hunter found a hybrid bear. They called it a Pizzly Bear or a Griller Bear because it looked like a mix of the two. But it actually was, it was a hybrid. Tests were later done in 2010 after more appeared in Alaska and Northern Canada. Now historically, polar bears branched off of grizzlies DNA-wise, but now we're at a point where they're coming back together. Why? Because everything's melting and food is becoming sparse. So now they're going further away to find food and in turn, they're meeting each other. And then they're, you know, doing the, doing the thing. Now they're starting to merge back together. And in turn, we get these terrifying bears. We have some human hybrids, some, some pig stuff, some, some milk talk. This list was loaded. This is a loaded pierogi full of uh, crossbreeding facts. There you go, just what you wanted to hear, I bet. Starting off our list at number 10, new bees. Great, sick of the old ones that sting you in the neck and then you're allergic? We got some new bees now to worry about. Here we go. A lot of us know bees are pretty harmless and kind of cute, hairy little pollinators. Unless, of course, like I mentioned, you're allergic or terrified of them. But truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm. Obviously, right? Save the bees. That was, of course, until an experiment in the 70s went south. Yeah, this experiment resulted in a new bee. Just a dangerous bee. The idea was to take a regular honey bee and breed it with a bee that is found in Africa that produces more honey. And of course, the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honey bee. Good stuff, right? On paper, this sounds like a step in the right direction. Well, the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. Yeah, liars. You're fired, all 1,000 of you. Get out of here. 
After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment, and in the 80s, we saw the beginning of a massive trouble. These bees are not only aggressive towards other kind of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they're also very aggressive towards human beings. Nice. And when these guys sting, their stinger stays with them, so they can, you know, continue to Julius Caesar you how many times they want. The victims of these swarms receive 10 times the amount of stings as regular swarms, so... Horrible, horrible news. And they react to disturbances 10 times faster and they will also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile. So, hope you can run really fast and really far. In our ninth spot, we have the Zubra. Now, you might be thinking, this is a cross with some animal and a zebra. Well, that's what I thought, but I was wrong. This is a cross between domestic cattle and the European bison. Bison, bison. Whatever. Zubrons were first created by Leopold Wallicki in 1847, but scientists didn't breed the first fertile Zubron until 1960. In fact, after World War I, a lot of people believed that Zubrons were going to replace domestic cattle because they were at a lower risk of developing diseases. So all throughout the 1950s and 60s, scientists were working on creating these animals in labs. Which I mean, any animal born in a lab always receives backlash and is subject to a number of controversies. But in the late 1980s, the experiments were shut down. Nowadays, there's only one herd left on Earth. Moving on to number eight, we have the humans with animal valves. When humans need to have a heart valve transplant, they have a couple of options. Either they can get a biological heart valve replacement or a mechanical heart valve replacement. Biological heart valve replacements are made from animal tissues, such as tissues from sheep, pigs, cows, even horses. In fact, many people walk around today are able to do so only because their hearts contain valves taken from animals. It's kind of trippy. In our seventh spot, we have Dan and Mary Gari. Dan and Mary Gari are transplant cardiologists who have managed to grow human muscle cells in pig embryos. They are now trying to grow human vasculature in pigs as well. The thing that they are worried about though is having someone's body reject the organs because it contains the blood vessels from pigs. Now, how did they go about this experiment? Well, they deleted the genes in the pig embryos that they would need to develop certain tissues. Then they inject modified human cells in there. After 17 to 27 days, the embryos made muscle tissues formed entirely of human cells. Moving on to number six, we have the Leopon. A Leopon is a mix between a male leopard and a female lion. And I swear every photo of them look fake or edited. It's because Leopons have a head of a lion with its mane, but then a body of a leopard with all its spots. Like it doesn't look real at all. It looks like someone photoshopped the two animals together. But alas, they are real and low-key terrifying. They can grow to be larger than their full-grown leopard father. Like, they are massive. The first reference to the Leopon was back in the first century by Roman author and naturalist Pliny the Elder. But it wasn't until 1910 that someone saw one in real life out in the wild. But again, controversy with these guys is that leopards and lions don't naturally mate with each other. They are forced to breed in captivity together. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the farm cattle. Back in the 1990s, farmers in India were led to believe that if they crossbred their cattle, then they would be able to create cattle that would produce more milk. So they were like, hell yeah, more milk equals more money. Sure, let's do it. So they ended up crossing different breeds of bulls together and with cows. But this had huge consequences for the farmers. In the end, they created cattle that would produce more milk, but needed to be fed more and needed higher quality food or else it wouldn't produce milk at all. Also, they were more prone to disease, so their vet bills were high. In the end, the cons outweighed the pros. They had to learn this the hard way. Moving on to number four, we have Hiromitsu Nakochi. Hiromitsu Nakochi is a stem cell biologist from Tokyo. He is determined to use animals to produce human cells or organs. Basically, he hopes to grow human cells in mice and rats and then transplant plant those embryos into bigger surrogate animals like sheep or pigs. Here's the thing, he's got restrictions. If while conducting the experiments, the rats or any animal starts to become more human-like, then they have to stop the experiments on them. It's part of the agreement he has with the government. They don't want humanized animals coming into existence, and neither do I. Moving on to number three, we have the pig embryos. So in all parts of these series, we talked about how scientists like to use pigs for their experiments 
experiments. Well, here's another group of researchers running tests on pigs. Scientists are currently working on growing kidneys in pigs. This team is collecting small samples of human blood or skin, and then the cells are separated, cultured, and then treated with different drugs. Next, the technician selects a pig embryo that was altered so that it lacks the gene that it would need to grow its own kidneys. So then the human cells were injected into it so it would grow human kidneys instead. Their hope is that when the pigs grow, they can then remove the human kidneys and then transplant it into the recipient's bodies. In fact, in the US alone, around 20 people die every day waiting for transplants, so this could help them. In our second spot, we have monkey human embryos. I'm telling you, scientists are running too many experiments on monkeys and chimps, and I'm not fond of the idea of having monkeys and humans crossing, you know, hello, planet of the apes, no thank you. Anyways, an international team of scientists introduced human stem cells into monkey embryos and maintained these embryos in culture. Some of the embryos live for up to 19 days, but only a small minority of the ones that had human cells in them did actually survive. And in our number one spot today, we have the Growler Bear. And honestly, I just like saying its name. Like, it sounds funny. Like, Growler. I love it. Anyways, this is a cross between a polar bear and a brown grizzly bear. I kid you not, sometimes they call it the Pizzly Bear. But it sounds like piss, so let's just stick with Growler. Now, Here's the thing, the reason why these bears are mating is actually really sad. Because of climate change, polar bears have less and less partners to mate with. So out of desperation, they're mating with grizzly bears. It's really sad. It's believed that the first growler bear was discovered in 2006. On April 16th, 2006, a hunter named Jim Martle was out hunting when he captured a growler bear. At first, he thought it was just a polar bear, but officials took a look at it and noticed that it had strange features. Later, it was determined that it was a growler bear. Kicking off the list at number 10, a lamel. Or a comma, you pick. That's the best part of these hybrid animals. They have two names, really, so you can choose whatever sounds the most silly. A lamel is the result of crossbreeding in Dubai. Yeah, the crown prince thought, you know what? We've made enough memories here. Let's make an animal. Why not? What could go wrong? Let's make a comma and name it Rama. And he did. He did just that. Rama the comma. Just rolls off the tongue. What could go wrong? Researchers in the United Arab Emirates artificially inseminated a camel back in 1998. They were hoping to have this this brand new animal born with the wool of a llama and the temperament of a camel. Instead, they got him, this little guy. Rama is known to be moody, but you know what? To be fair, I would be moody as well if I was just born. If I was just created out of nowhere. Like, why do my knees hurt? They're like, well, those are new knees. We have never seen those knees before. So that's why they're clicking. Number nine. Wolfen. These guys were created when a female common bottlenose dolphin was bred with a male false killer whale. Yeah, we shouldn't be doing this. They're extremely rare and they have been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity because humans are the worst. The first recorded wolfin was born in the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Didn't even make it one year. Horrible. Probably a prime example of why they maybe shouldn't exist in the first place. I don't know, just a wild observation. The first that was born in the United States that actually somehow survived was at Sea Life Park in Hawaii in May 1985, and her name was Kekamalu. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days, the second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully the third one is still alive. In March last year, both Kekamalu and her daughter were still alive, but they remain, of course, in captivity. So it's like, great. But not, really not at the same time. Number eight, farm cattle. Back in the 90s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which in turn would mean more money for them and their families. Awesome, this should be amazing and great news, right? Well, considering why we're here watching, I don't think it's, uh, it's gonna end the way we think, no. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great results, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, great, but they also needed way more food. They needed high quality food as well, or else they'd stop producing more milk and they were less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits. So it cost them more money, you know what I mean? Yeah, we got more milk, but we have to spend more money on maintaining the damn thing. It's not a win. It's not a win in my book. Number seven, old Buffalo Jones. Here we go. A guy named Charles Buffalo Jones. Let's talk about him. This man started breeding animals in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was exceptionally low. So bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. Nice. Old Buffalo Jones getting his science on. 
He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state. And the numbers remained relatively low because of limited hunting licenses. Well, when the beefalo, good name, found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and therefore aren't any you know, natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's a lot of beefalo. So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that has the real trouble. First off, they're very thirsty animals and they can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole. So they're sucking it all up, you know what I mean? It's like when you're in school and you're waiting for water and the guy in front of you just keeps drinking. You're like, oh my God, what are you doing? Where is this going? Not to mention the fact that they do their dirty business in the water and that basically just ruins it all. Basically, they've thrown the entire ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and insects and plant life around have also been infected, all because they're thirsty and they like to take big shits where we all drink our water. Thanks, Beefalo. Number six, hybrid lion. Back in the 1980s, the Chatbir Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller, has a less shaggy mane. They would breed that with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. Again, sounds like a great plan at first. How do we make it happen without making weird animals? The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their other two Asiatic lions. Nice. Hey, we'll save ya. Just kidding, even worse. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake as the cubs all had severely weak back legs. They were all shaky. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, their immune system started to fail more and more. Sadly, by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions and they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction further. There's also laws that prohibited them from killing animals, so they were simply just waiting around for them to die naturally. It's kind of a weird circle we got. Into. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they just wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they had. Know what I mean? It was right there and they're like, all right, now let's try something new. It's like, what? No, why? Number five, Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing, here we go, halfway through, time to turn it up a bit. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. Now this was a time before even horses arrived, so they had to do something, right? Large kungas would pull wagons and smaller ones would help pulling plows. These little guys, they were the talk of the town. Imagine hybrid animals before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Yeah, yeah, yummy, I wonder what this one is. Smells a little stinky. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. And it's a wild ass over there. Hey, nice wild ass. It's wild what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from even thousands of years ago. It's mind blowing. More amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. Number four, super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Just tons of a moo, just a mighty moo. Introducing the super cow. All right, start your day off with some super milk and then have a super stomach ache and shit your super pants. Only in Belgium, let's do it. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmer brought together native cattle and shorthorn cattle. After that, they would literally pick the biggest of the bunch and then have them breed together. These cows are officially called Belgian blues but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. I can't even look at these guys. They're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. That makes no sense. They have like eight biceps, the incredible Hulk, just with more milk. Number three, the mouse with an ear on its back. Oh, I want to Q-tip this guy every time I see him. The mouse with a human ear, folks. How did this happen? This is like the world's greatest mouse spy. Stuart Little's evil brother. Let's do it. Back in 1997, this vacanti mouse became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, aka cells from a cow. And clearly it worked a little too well. It's a little odd what we have. We're still talking about it, obviously. It's weird. It all started when Joseph Vicanti, a pediatric surgeon, began designing human organs. This was during a shortage in time. He wasn't just bored and started to make ears. He was changing the medical game. And little did he know, he was about to change the science game as well. He constructed an ear and he told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob to not bring up the fact that he attached said ear to a live mouse. Kind of hard to bring up, but we'll do our best. Okay. Chuck failed. He spilled the beans almost right away. But now we know that cow cartilage can create human cells. That's great. I want to Q-tip his back. Is that weird? That's not weird. Gives ear cheese a whole new meaning. We're going to throw out. Number two, the Zorse. I'll give you a second to figure out what animal this is. 
Nice, there you go. Male zebra, female horse. Now we've got a really fun word. Zebroids are also quite common historically. Charles Darwin even noted some in his work. So since the 19th century, crossbreeding zebras with horses and donkeys, it's all been done. More often than not, and this is what makes them stand out, zebroids will experience dwarfism. It's pretty cute. In 2010, a zedonk was born, a zebra donkey. All these fun names, right? But again, back in the 70s, three were born in Colchester Zoo. These zookeepers were like, hmm, how do we make zoos new and hip and bizarre? Are. Oh, I know. Humans are not great. Humans are too bored, it seems. And finally, number one, Hiramitsu Nakauchi. Stem cell biologist from Tokyo. This last one is too wild. Just recently, his experiments have been approved by the government, so things are actively in play here. Not old Farmer Joe in the early 1900s. No, we're getting to modern science now. Hiramitsu hopes to grow human cells inside mice and rats, right? Like we just talked about. But then he wants to transplant those embryos into surrogate animals. A lot of animals, a lot of cells, a lot of traffic going in and out. Cells into rats and mice embryos, how do we even get here? We went from Salem witch trials to rodents being genetically manipulated so they can make pancreases for you. What? But his hope here was that the rodents' bodies will be used for human cells to then make a pancreas for themselves. So it's kind of like a kickoff into biology, right? Here's the thing, while conducting said experiments, they found out that rats were starting to develop a human-type brain. Yeah, that's when they decided to pull the plug, rightfully so. The second humans and animals get too close, governments come in and they go, hey, stop, thanks. Mm -hmm.